Hello, everybody. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. My name is uh, Martin Lovers. I'm Chief Trend Watcher of uh, Supply Chain Media. You might also know me as the Editor-in-Chief of uh, Supply Chain Movement, European Quarterly, and also a newsletter. And in, in the Netherlands, I'm also an Editor-in-Chief of a Dutch Supply Chain uh, Magazine. So welcome. Um, we'll have an interesting conversation uh, with Heide Larsen. Uh, I will introduce her later. We're going to discuss uh, uh, how to fit your supply chain and uh, to fit it for growth in, in a changing world. So uh, we have a live webinar this hour, and um, and we have a great, uh, wait up, here you are. We have a great uh, uh, partner with me. So um, you see me on the left, and on the right you see uh, Heidi. Heidi, welcome. Hello, and thank you for having me. All right, um, so a few uh, things uh, before we uh, kick off. So uh, this webinar will be recorded, and uh, the, Presentation will be made available as PDF uh, within uh, 48 hours. Um, people, you know, you, you have all the uh, opportunity to ask questions. We do have a Q&A at the end, uh, but uh, feel free to ask uh, questions immediately, and I will uh, pick it up and I'll ask them to, to Heidi. So you see on the right-hand side, you see a chat function, but also a Q&A. So please use the Q&A. I will track it and uh, see uh, questions coming in. So uh, join the conversation I will be having with, uh, with Heidi. Um, and um, normally, I would say um, uh, we would have also uh, an exit conversation afterwards at five o'clock, 30 minutes in AirMeet. Uh, so uh, I will show you here. So we have a functionality where you can meet uh, the speakers of uh, our webinar Wednesday in a kind of Zoom meeting afterwards. So, but I will be there. I will be sitting at table one. So if people want to join and, and have a conversation with me, that's fine. But Heidi has to leave for a boardroom meeting uh, afterwards. So that's, that's pity, but uh, then again, more reason to ask his questions uh, right away. All right, um, so yes, let me introduce uh, Heidi. So um, something about you, you know, you are nicknamed as a, the supply chain princess. And here you see all kinds of things from uh, from television. I think, you know, you've been on uh, Danish television quite a lot. So uh, I've never made it to television in the Netherlands, but uh, you have done <laughs> it in uh, Denmark. So tell me about uh, yourself. How how uh, did you became nicknamed the supply chain uh, uh, princess? Well, it's actually a, a funny story. And it, it took me quite some years to embrace that nickname, actually. Um, because at the, at first, when I started out, um, I'm, I'm born in supply chain. I have another background within innovation. And, and within uh, bridging supply chain and innovation, I worked in the private industry, within the fashion companies and uh, home decor industry and such. Mm -hmm. and, and when I set up my own uh, consultancy company in, in 2011, this uh, was also where I started to uh, yeah, write or gather, you should say, what became my first book, Easily Made for China. Uh, Easily Made in China was my first book. Uh, and um, fate uh, brought me to, uh, to the fact that this was the very first official meet from a Chinese uh, president. That was Hu Jintao at the time. Mm -hmm. So that was the first official uh, visit to Denmark. And the Danish uh, media called me to ask if I would be on the studio. And I was like... Hey, yeah, but my angle is culture, my angle is people, and, and what drives me as a person is the relations in the supply chain. Uh, not so much what you can gather in an Excel sheet and, and what you can optimize like financially. Uh, it's quite easy to make an impressive track record when you work with supply chain, but what I find the, the most interesting is the relationship behind it and how you set up sustainable relations globally in an ever-changing world. So I spoke a lot about sourcing, uh, and uh, then I did a, a speak uh, on how to, yeah, when, when you, I, I set it up such like a fairy tale, you could say. Mm -hmm. So you have a, a princess, and she has to kiss a lot of frogs before she finds a true prince, and the prince has to go through uh, some challenges before you can know that he's worthy of the kingdom. So, so this was kind of like my my prefix for this speech, and and this was uh, what the the Danish media uh, picked up and and nicknamed named me uh, such as a ch supply chain princess. And after having uh, trying to avoid that nickname for I think three years or something like that, uh, one day the my phone rang, and uh, this was from uh, from somebody who could remember me three years ago. Uh, from an, a specific event based on my title. 
And I thought to myself, well, rather than running from it, maybe I should embrace it because a China consultant is somewhat taken, right? A supply chain princess is something everybody can remember. So maybe it has a, maybe it has an, an angle to it that, uh, that I didn't think of to begin with. And uh, it, it kind of relates a lot to the Chinese culture and, and the Chinese way of doing business and, and the Chinese look at Europe and Denmark, especially as this uh, fairy tale kingdom. So I think it, uh, it touches upon some of the areas of, of the cultural bridges that I'm looking to connect. And, and this was why I said, OK, let's embrace it after three years. <laughs> Yeah. So, do the Chinese see Denmark as a kingdom, or the other way around? How do you see that? Yes, they they see it like a uh, H. Uh, G. Anderson and all the fairy tales. Yeah. Okay. So, so they they kind of like see it as a as a small fairy tale kingdom. Yes. Okay. And to the left, you see uh, the book uh, "Easily Made in China." So that's yes. the first one, and on the mm -hmm. right one, you see "Easily Made for China." Yes. So that that's the other way around. Or how do you? Yes. How should I explain it? Easily made in China is how to set up productions in China uh, based on a cultural angle and, and what to do and certainly what not to do. It has uh, case studies in it and uh, yeah, um, how, how do you set up supply chain and, and productions and, and corporations that will work uh, despite the ever-changing market? Uh, avoiding the most common pitfalls and you can say easily made for China is how to sell to the Chinese uh, middle uh, group or, or so to say mm -hmm. or how to distribute your goods into the Chinese market. Okay, We'll get to that later on because it's yeah. a changing world and everybody uh, still are looking at China as one hand uh, the factory of the world and on the other hand yes. also as a growth market. So yeah. um, can you explain what kind of uh, customers you have? You, you are doing speeches, kind of consulting um yes. so what is it what you do yeah well um i i do a little bit of uh of both i would say because i i do speeches i do uh, keynotes i do workshops uh, and i also set up uh, supply chains in china or in the I actually set them up globally, but mostly in China. Mm -hmm. So uh, my phone will ring either for inspiration on supply chain, uh, such as yourself, um, mm -hmm. or it will be from uh, facilitating a workshop on a supply relationship management, digital relationship management, how, um, how to negotiate uh, with your suppliers, uh, supplier surveys, uh, setting up QCs and what now. Uh, and then uh, you could say I have the, the smallest client of mine is, is only himself. And uh, I believe the biggest one is F.L. Smith. So it's kind of like uh, from one end to another. Um, what resonates with me is the processes and the people behind it and not so much what you produce or what you sell, but, but how you do it. That's what uh, keeps me interested. And if you look at these these uh, company names, because uh, Denmark mm -hmm. is known for design, no, uh, yeah. but uh, so what kind of companies are these you're mentioning here? Diaper Kern is maybe the the most well known outside of Denmark. It's a jewelry um, business. Uh, yeah, has a lot to do with the jewelries and in silverware and. Uh, yeah, all sorts of jewelry, and you can say menu is uh, home decor, and they also do furniture now. Uh, and tradition is a mostly furniture company now, and they also they also do lamps and, and such, but smaller furnitures. Saint Tropez is uh, a part of uh, IC company and is a fashion company. And 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 uh, all these companies, they are producing in in, in uh, China or all, also producing locally here in Europe for China. So what is it? They are, they are producing globally, all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would say, yeah, roughly in put it into black and white. I will say maybe it's something like seventy percent in China and the rest uh, in in the rest of the world uh, within Europe mostly. And, yes. and, and yeah. when you started out, your first book uh, made in China, was it different yeah. than later on? So that the people are now more and more producing for China and maybe outside China for China? Yes. All right. Yes. Um, I, I was wondering, you know, so we, we are going to talk about, uh, well, uh, the turbulent world around us. And uh, mm -hmm. so you, you have uh, taken some uh, uh, Danish uh, press well, uh, well yep. articles, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my Danish is not that well, but I can uh, I can recognize bestseller on the left hand side and uh, yes. 
uh, delivery problems. That's quite similar exactly. to the Dutch on the right hand side. Yeah. All right. So, so what do you see in Denmark, and uh, what is your Danish pr perspective on the whole supply chain uh, challenges? Well, right now, I, I don't think the Danish challenges are somewhat different than the rest of the world's. Mm -hmm. uh, the Danish challenges are, are somewhat the same. So you have the price increments, uh, you have the freight charges, that is a whole chapter for itself. Uh, you have the, um, the, the flights uh, being grounded, so you cannot visit your suppliers uh, like you used to. Uh, and you have the uh, shortages uh, in commodities, so you have empty shelves, and you have that in, in Denmark, and I think you have that in the rest of the world. Yeah. So and, uh, I, I don't think they're different. No, and what was mentioning in the, this article on the left, uh, yeah. bestseller, bestseller is a fashion brand with uh, Only and Jack and Jones and, and, and more like that. So what's yeah. what it's saying on the left? Well, this is from uh, last week, and this is uh, the, the financial times in Denmark, you could say, mm -hmm. if I didn't if I roughly translate it. And uh, what it says here is that uh, Bessela has just opened up a, a 100,000 square meters warehouse or, or logistics center in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is what they call a uh, logistics center uh, West, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And they set up another in uh, Spain, with, which is the South one. And, and so, so they set up a uh, more regional based logistics centers rather than sending everything to uh, to Denmark. So okay. they're embracing or trying to solve the freight challenges that we see all over the world globally right now. So instead of sending everything to Denmark and then distributing it from their Danish headquarters in the Danish logistics center, they're trying to send it directly to these regional hubs or so to say hubs or logistics centers or, or what to call them and and this is to overcome the the both the financial burden of the freight charges these days but also the lead time because the lead time is also a great problem uh, and this is what causing these uh, empty shelves in the uh, uh, in the shops and in the retailers yeah and, um, on the and right inside you see uh, delivery problems and i see uh, mercedes yeah. that's an ad isn't it it's an ad, and and this is just to say that shortage in the market is really a thing. Uh, so it's it's becoming a buzzword to the level where you now market yourself by not having problems by in in your supply chain, or you don't have empty shelves. So that's actually a competitor edge now. So so uh, what what means what what does the the the, the phrase "ikhos os"? I have supply. Uh, it means not by us. All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so well, so I, I think that the, the shortage uh, in yeah global shortage, you could say, I think it's a it's becoming an issue when you can use it as a competitor's edge and you're advertising that you don't have this. Right. I, I think then, then you have reached a, a certain level. Yeah, or maybe your your cars selling uh, not well enough. So uh, maybe <laughs> you, maybe you got, that's you, a marketing you, angle. <laughs> you, you got stuck with it. You know, so I, I've ordered a new uh, car, a Skoda mm -hmm. Superb, and uh, I was called by my dealer. I you know they will be delivered. I think in March somewhere, and I ordered in uh, I think it was August or something. But I got a call that uh, they couldn't uh, deliver my uh, stereo set. I had ordered, you know, I didn't know, but anyway, so a subwoofer wasn't uh, available. So. I could c cancel the whole car, or I could uh, uh, stick with another uh, car system. And you know, yeah, I like music, but not, not, not enough to cancel my car because <laughs> of a subwoofer. But you know, that's that's the state we're in. So uh, mm. they can deliver the car, but not mm. well the, the ordered uh, stereo sound, whatever. Mm. All right. Um, yeah. So, so I, we see the same same thing. It's yeah. a global supply chain storm, and uh, we see shortages in uh, you know uh, containers, uh, shipping shortages, and and the prices related to this. And you see that you know there are uh, container ships, at, especially at Long Beach, waiting to be unloaded. Now they're gonna solve it, hopefully. But I think uh, up to seventy uh, container ships are waiting to be unloaded at the Long Beach. We don't have that kind of problems in, in in europe in hamburg or copenhagen or amsterdam or rotterdam whatever so we, we, we are better off than the us i would say um but there are also shortage in truck drivers uh especially in the uk and also in the us and there's a lot of shortages in uh, in the us what we uh, uh, in the warehouses and a, a funny thing what is happening now in the us it's called uh, uh the big uh, 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 what is it they are retiring. So a lot of people have uh, uh, 
quit some jobs. Some of them have more than one jobs. They have quit one or two jobs because they think uh, they can do with less. A big resignation is it called in the US. Hmm. So uh, a lot of people, especially in warehousing, say okay, maybe that's the second or third job, quit their job because uh, they have found out during the lockdowns they can do with, uh, with, with less money and less work. So that's uh, a problem in the US. And, but we don't see it in Europe yet. Uh, there's shortages in labor here. Uh, there's a lot of uh, 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 shortages in truck drivers in the UK. What do you see in Denmark? Do you see a shortage in truck drivers and order pickers over there? No. Uh, I would say it, it's more in, in the upper scales of the organization. It's within supply chain. It's within sourcing. It's mm -hmm. within uh, product development. It's within sea uh, level. It's within, yeah. More the white yeah. collar. White people. collar, you would say. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, right. So, okay. Um, what we saw last year, and this is a cartoon of last year, and then, you know, uh, this cartoon is like, you know, uh, there's a COVID wave uh, hitting us. And uh, the, this, this guy, this person that was expecting recession. And have we have seen, you know, there was a, uh, only a short recession uh, uh, last year. And now it's, uh, you know, um, uh, hitting back positively. So uh, no recession, uh, I would say. And next, they, he was expecting there will be a climate change wave. Now we are just after Glasgow. I don't know what you are thinking. Is, is there a, a climate change wave coming or are there other things happening? Uh, I would say I would hope so, <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think there is a, a discrepancy or a gap between what we want and uh, and what we will pay for, and and that when when I see it, it's kind of like what we saw in two thousand and seven, just before the financial crisis, mm -hmm. uh, and and in two thousand and six and seven, there was a lot of companies asking for the uh, CO two footprint or the carbon footprint of their goods, uh, and and they wanted to have the calculations on the specific productions or products or yeah processes what now mm -hmm. but it was it, it it kind of phased out because nobody could really relate to this carbon footprint i remember em entering the airport one day and there was a lot of uh, uh, numbers if you go to budapest it will be this carbon footprint if you go to london it will be th this carbon footprint and, and i was like is, is this a lot or is it a little I yeah. had no idea because there was no uh, measurement chart for this. And this is, and I think that was why it became an nice to have rather than need to have. And then came the financial crisis and then everybody forgot about it. Yeah. Then I saw in 2017, 18 people began speaking about this again. But then COVID hit, you could say. And, and now I see that there is a... Um, there is a talk about this uh, sustainability within supply chain, but I think it has a, a, a yeah, split angle to it because you can you can look at it from from two ways as I see it. You can see a, a, a production side of things where you can produce your product in a sustainable way. And the reason why you would do that is because of a, a demand from the market. So it's your customers or your consumers that are uh, asking for you to produce in a sustainable way. It has a higher price, uh, so they must be willing to pay that higher price in production. That's one angle to it. And then there's another angle to it, which is from what I hear the most. And, and that is on the freight charges. So how are you going to transport your goods around the world? And instead of transporting your goods uh, two or three times around the world, then you set up these, uh, like I said, bestseller did, these uh, regional hubs, and mm -hmm. you try to optimize how many mileage you will transport your goods and, and the way you will do it. And, and then you will angle that as a sustainability in your supply chain. We also right, see right now, especially uh, since last week in Glasgow, now a lot of mm. companies are sticking to uh, the ESG uh, uh, yeah. uh, norms, but mainly that's what we call in the supply chain scope one or scope two. It's you know it's energy consumption within your company and uh, the CO2 within your company. Uh, that's uh, scope one and scope two. But yes. the energy uh, consumption and the CO2 in your whole value chain. There's also yeah. at your suppliers and your tier two suppliers and so forth one and downstream that's scope three. You know, a lot of companies aren't there yet by far. So and most of the companies even don't know 
the supplier of their supplier, the tier two suppliers. Mm -hmm. So that, that that's uh, already uh, a big issue. But that will be the next wave or hurdle or challenge to to uh, to to manage. To what is my tier two supplier, and what is the CO two uh, uh, footprint upstream? Yes. I was wondering, with, with your Danish uh, uh, customers or, or, or partners you are uh, advising, etc., is it also something you are looking into because you are uh, setting up uh, supply chains in China to produce over there for these Danish companies? Is it also something that you are addressing to look beyond the, the first tier supplier beyond? Or what did you do in there yes. in China? Yes. I, I believe that you should try your, your very best to look beyond tier one because this will affect your, like you say, I, I agree with you, uh, upstream and downstream, you have to to reach the highest level of transparency in, uh, transparency in, in your supply chain. And, and you can only do that if you know who you're dealing with. And I'm not saying that you cannot deal with traders because there can be uh, competitive edges or competitive reasons why you should buy something from a trader or a trading agency. Uh, but you should just know that this is what you're doing. So, yeah. so you should try to investigate then how is the facilities and how is the yeah um, the setup at at the tier two supplier. Um, and you, of course, this is perfectly. Uh, okay to ask and it's okay to to dig deeper the the good question is whether it's possible and and that resonates back to the uh, relations and and the yeah the how strong is your relation with your supplier or trader or trading agency or what now but but how is how is the relationship and, and can that relationship bear the the digging or will it be lost forever if you try to figure out who is tier two so, so when you said set, we're setting up these kind of supply chain for these Danish mm -hmm. companies in China, did you go to China every time or a few times? Or how did you do that in, in practicalities? Uh, there is uh, people in China, uh, Chinese people who are who are who are helping me um, finding these suppliers on site. So I'm not going to China every week. Mm -hmm. um, so they are handling a lot of it uh, for me out there. So and a lot of it has to do with the network. It, it's not it's it's not too different than how you do business in Europe, I would say. It's maybe a little bit more difficult to establish the network in China, but it's certainly possible. And the beauty of uh, doing business with uh, with Chinese suppliers is that you can more or less predict in which area you should look for which commodities. Uh, so you would have, for example, steels and gadgets and and so forth you will have that in the in the south in, in guangzhou uh, guangzhou and shenzhen and and what now and you will have fashion in hangzhou ningbo shanghai so forth and you will have uh, jewelry in Qingdao, or just to name a few but but you have this uh, cultural thing that success generates success so if my neighbor is successful in a certain business then i could set up a business just like it next door and i would also be successful so so this is what yeah i'm, I'm putting it into black and white but but to make it a little bit uh, easier um then uh, i think it's uh, yeah it has these uh, regional competitive edges and and which commodities are, are located where is uh, something that is quite easy to get an overview of, I would say. But but, but you have established this this network in China exactly. being, yes. being being there, so you have exactly. to exactly go... yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It it's it it is established by a lot of factory visits and a lot of dinners and a lot of hours in taxis and in cars and and what now yes uh, i i spent more time in china than in danish soil uh, from 2008 until 11 i was more in china than in denmark okay uh, before you get to this relationship building uh, we, your your core uh, piece i would say you know getting back to what we have written and published in 2019 already before covid-19 we we wrote about you know uh, where to manufacture in europe and there was already a tendency to look into Europe, where to manufacture it. So from going east, uh, outsourced to China, and you know, cheap labor and cheap products and a more operational excellence approach. There was a tendency, you know, uh, to go more made in Europe, more customer intimacy close by in the European market. Um, did you also uh, saw that uh, already in, uh, did you see that in, already in, in Denmark at that time that also uh, Danish companies were also looking into Europe to uh, manufacture more close by? 
Yeah. Uh, and I will see this is not a new trend. I've, I've been seeing that since 2006 when I started out my career. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, from time to time, there will be a client who will do a, a due diligence project on uh, evaluating the efficiency or the cost or, or the, yeah, what what is now uh, of value to you. Some uh, is uh, lead time, some is total cost, some is price, some is a, a certain process in the in the production or, or what now. Um, but but from time to time, I get the question of evaluating uh, European suppliers with the Chinese suppliers or, or even Chinese suppliers to Asian suppliers and and figuring out is will it still resonate to locate our supplier in China or should we go to Europe? Um, and so, so this is not a new trend. This I would just say that more and more are choosing suppliers in Europe, but only the ones who are competing for a shorter lead time. I would say. Yeah, you know, but but I, I was uh, taking this this example from 2019. This art, yeah. article, why? Because it's co before COVID 19, and now it's getting back. Companies are mm. uh, talking about uh, reshoring uh, uh, because of the long lead times from China and that kind of stuff. So that's that's why I'm 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 I'm, I'm uh, pitching this uh, article. Uh, a year later, um, uh, there, there, then you know, so, uh, COVID hit uh, uh, the world, and there was uh, all kind of disruptions. You see, uh, uh, lockdowns, trade wars, Brexit, revolts, floods closures whatever whatever and uh how mm. to get you uh, to your store your shop your hospital your jail or your office so this is uh, the, the the supply chain red race that we, we were seeing last year um in, in in your line of business so we're talking to the danish companies is also that they are talking about disruptions which to to address and which to well uh, circumvent yeah, but it will again depend on what is your uh, value chain, uh, what is your purpose, and, and what is your mission. Because mm -hmm. if, if you're only looking at price, then you can always find cheaper prices. Yeah. Of course, you can always uh, squeeze the price. That's that's what I said in, in the beginning. It's not difficult to uh, create an impressive track record based on an Excel sheet. But, but what is interesting is to set up a relationship that can cover the... Um, potential need of a commodity or a supplier in year two or three down the road. We don't really know if we're going to use it, but it's a strategic product of ours and, and it, it will be something that will expand our business, but we cannot yet honor that relationship with an order. So mm -hmm. if we cannot use financials uh, to negotiate or to keep ourselves attractive or make ourselves attractive, then how do we establish this, that relationships? So again, I think that the challenges are the same in Denmark as in the rest of the world, but I think more and more people are now more, let's say, aware of their core business. And as we see in every crisis ever, yeah, like ever throughout times, mm -hmm. when a crisis happens, then, then we kind of move into our core business. Uh, and, and this is also what I see in Denmark right now. And, you know, we, we did a survey uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, what we call the, the inventory strategy survey uh, among 175 uh, supply chain directors, both in manufacturing, wholesale and retail. And, well, um, regardless of their uh, business strategy being mm -hmm. operational excellence, product leadership or customer intimacy, the, the, the majority are saying that now reliability, the reliability of delivery is is key you know so price yeah. is number two and quality was number three but reliability is you know the most important because if you can't deliver anyway either if you have a cheap product or a expensive product you know if you can't deliver anyway you, you're out of business so uh reliability exactly. is, is number one now exactly and that that is back to your previous slide right mm -hmm. because if if you set up uh, if, if you're looking to find a, a big a better price and you then move from your Chinese supplier to a European supplier, then you need to take out some resources in, as in time and money to set up that new relationship. And, and if something then still disrupts that supplier and, and you cannot deliver, then what was the purpose? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And um, what we're seeing right now, we just published uh, uh, an article uh, this month, actually. And this picture is quite strange. You know, 
we've seen um, there's a huge uh, growth uh, in in uh, container shipping in the sea shipping and there was you know shortages because of containers and because of ships not being unloaded etc so as an as a result as um, a lot of companies were saying you know we, we put our stuff on trains so uh, on trains rail cargo from China to Europe uh, via Kazakhstan and uh, uh, either Turkey or Russia so that's what what was happening, uh, and especially last year, you saw some companies uh, diverting their uh, sea freight to uh, rail freight from China. Um, but uh, there was something strange happening that you know, Maersk, you know, uh, not able to deliver, uh, was being under pressure um, by a few uh, major uh, customers, multinationals, and they put them to extra trains on their own from China to Europe. And as a result, there was a huge stack of containers in Kazakhstan, just over the border from China to Kazakhstan. Four thousand containers were stuck, and uh, the, the 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 volume of uh, trains has um, doubled and doubled again, so fourfold. So basically, uh, the Kazakhstan uh, rail uh, uh, company couldn't handle the, all these these new trains. So these trains were stuck over there, not being able to go into China, uh, Russia, or or uh, Turkey. And as a result of that, companies who have put their stuff on the train are putting it now on trucks. So what we're seeing right now is a caravan of trucks with containers driving from China all the way to Europe overland. So that's what we're, we're seeing right now as a result of uh, you know a huge blockage in, in China in the rail cargo. Do, have you have you known this? <laughs> have you seen this? I didn't experience it from my customers, but yes, I heard about it. Uh, and, and what I think is the funny thing about this is that actually these trucks will reach European customers faster than the ships. Yeah. I think that that's, uh, yeah, yeah that, that, that puzzles me. Why, why the, the containers needs uh, three or four weeks in the port before even leaving uh, at sea. I, I really think that the, the, Freight issue is a chapter to itself, uh, and and we will need. I'm sure there's expert that will know a lot more about that than I. Um, but but I'm really really curious and puzzled <laughs> as yes. to why uh, why the situation has occurred. Well, you know, like I explained, that there are different uh, mm -hmm. things uh, triggering each other. But you now it's cheaper to uh, to rent a truck with a container from China driving all the way overland yeah. to to uh, to Europe, to the Netherlands or Denmark. Than using uh, a sea cargo with uh, you know an ocean, and uh, but you know the CO2 footprint is way higher than uh, by uh, the sea cargo. But nonetheless, you know companies are doing it anyway because otherwise they don't get their stuff here in Europe. Exactly, and and it's it's kind of like the the never ending story because I, I spoke to Novo, uh, Novo Nordisk in Denmark, yep. and and they yep. are they're multiplying their fre normal freight charges by nine these days. Nine. Yeah. And then I spoke to uh, another guy from DSV. He's because I was like, well, when will we see normal, the normal situation back on track, or, or when will things normalize? And he said, well. Don't hold your breath because um, we, we need to, uh, maybe we need to end 2023 before we will see normalization. So I think this is, uh, yeah, this is really critical. Yeah. And, and, and this is why European suppliers are, are, being, are becoming more attractive because they are closer. Yeah. And, you know, when I t tell this story to companies, they say, you know, it's incredible because we are, you know, we want a more sustainable supply chain. But we are, you know, enlarging the CO2 footprint by getting the stuff from China by truck. And uh, that's one thing. On the other hand, you see strange things that Maersk is making so much profit. And they, they said, you know, not to raise the prices any, anymore. But, you know, it's still already incredibly high. But now Maersk is buying Boeings. So they are going into air cargo. So, you know, that's there's a whole strange Thing happening into this uh, transport world uh, itself. So, um, but not getting into it much into the to, uh, detail as, 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 as this. What I've seen, you know, um, I see a ripple effect in all kind of uh, disruption. So, uh, starting from the bottom, you, uh, you see COVID nineteen happening last year. Uh, you know, that ended in uh, a lot all kind of lockdowns first in China, then in Europe, and all around the world, and then. You know, uh, companies are opening up, and then they uh, get new lockdowns, especially in China. 
uh, closing down uh, locally, but still making uh, all kinds of disruptions. You see shortages, uh, and now we see as also as a result, fuel prices is going up. And then, you know, the economists uh, are thinking that uh, this inflation will go away. I doubt it, because in the end, all this uh, uh, price increases in raw materials will e will end up at the consumer uh, one way they one way or the other because in the end you know someone has to pay the bill and uh, and the companies has to uh, make profit uh, and that could lead it, it to a recession again that that might be my conclusion if these things stay happening like this and maybe, they, maybe there are more ripples. It could have happened uh, again in a recession. I was wondering, you know, the Danish company you are talking to or are advising, etc. What do they see with their prices and their, you know, uh, the, you know, the, the, the raw materials uh, prices are going up? Yeah, are they are they able to uh, uh, ask uh, more to raise their prices to their consumer, be it B two B or B two C? I'm actually quite surprised of how many companies who has managed to keep the prices to their consumers. Mm -hmm. So, so I think it's only one or two companies that I know of, and, and that's a is a one hundred percent non scientific study. <laughs> so this is just what who uh, who I've been speaking to. Um, but but I think uh, two companies alone are the only ones uh, forwarding this uh, price increase uh, to the market, even though everybody understands this because it's all over the news, and and everybody with the just a little bit of interest in, in international trade will know this very well. I hear in the boardroom that um, companies are talking about uh, maybe pushing this uh, to the market and, and increasing prices as we move into 2022. But let's see. Yeah, well, I, I hear it a lot around me also mm. here in the Netherlands that uh, companies are raising prices to consumer, to the end consumer or to mm. the end customer. Uh, but so... It, it will happen. The inflation will go up in the end. So I was talking to a manufacturer of paint and in the end, you know, maybe on the B2B or the B2C side, you know, they have to raise prices. Uh, otherwise, maybe on a short term, they can stick it out, uh, be comfortable with less profit or maybe with the growth, uh, they have still enough uh, EBIT growth that they can uh, deal with it. But in the end, I do think that the prices will go up and then we get more inflation. If it will result in a recession, we will see. But um, I do think that the inflation will go up and that will dampen, in, in my sense, the the economic growth globally or at least per, per country. I got a question from your audience um, regarding this kind of di disruption. Have the current supply chain disruption challenged the human relationships built up over years, or have these relationships helped to find solutions? And maybe you can tell something in your environment. Uh, well, actually, what I was quite amazed about is uh, when I first uh, like uh, uh, got my pulse down after uh, March 2020, <laughs> maybe moved in uh, to April and, and May, what I saw back then was that the, the companies who were first served when, when orders started moving out of China again after the, the initial uh, lockdown, this was not the biggest company. It was not the, the company with the, the biggest financial muscles. It was the company who had the better relations. It was the smaller and medium-sized companies who did a great job in just calling up and say, wow, uh, how is life? Uh, are you okay? Is, is your family okay? And, and asking questions to the the people of their value chain uh, and not just companies, if, if you understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. So so actually, I, I yeah, uh, it has to do with the relations. And I will say that uh, I, I heard a, a very interesting uh, talk from uh, Legade, um, tax company and the, the tax free company sorry and they said um they they uh, segmented their uh, suppliers into tier one tier two tier three of uh, of their uh, organization the same as everybody did right uh, in in the beginning but but they managed to to go through this crisis without losing any of their relations because they spent a lot of time addressing the uh, critical situation not just inside the company but also outside the company and and to the relations that are between the companies so yes um, you can achieve better prices you can um, you can go further together if you have a strong relation 
Um, but of course, when crisis happens and nobody knows uh, what tomorrow will bring and you're sitting there looking at your order volume and you don't know if it, if, uh, if your customers will drop by 75% tomorrow, of course, when you're in a crisis mode, it's very difficult to take decisions. Uh, and to make decisions and, and to stick to them uh, and to navigate in into what is really crisis management. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the, the stronger relations you have, the better, the or the, or the more resilient you will be in these crises, I would say. Yeah, I, I get the same experience. I had a conversation <laughs> with our the members of our supply chain directors club in the Netherlands, and they all agree that the... Uh, you know, now uh, the quality of the relationship has been proven in, in this day and age of this disruptions. Yes. And also for suppliers from uh, parts, but also from uh, logistics service providers. So you will see who are your friends in these days, I would say, you know, and uh, that's what I find also with, with the, the, the companies I'm talking to in high tech mm -hmm. and uh, also in uh, pharma and other areas and so all kind of areas. So. Um, you you have you've written a lot about relationships and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I was wondering you know uh, about these challenges in, in relationships. So um, if you go to um, your core of what you're addressing a, a lot, you know, what is the secret to to, to build these kind of uh, uh, relationships? Well, the the secret is to be curious and to really understand what is the. Uh, what is at play at the factory or supplier or co yeah, collaboration or partner or what now? But what is really at play and why do they ask the questions that they ask? Mm -hmm. If they don't have ask any questions at all, then, then you should be worried. Uh, and instead of just saying, oh, they will uh, they will ask me the questions when, when time is and, and then be mad if, if something goes wrong down the, uh, down the corporation, then maybe finding out is everything understood? Is everything okay? Is there a shortage in workers? Uh, we've seen that in the past five or six years now in China. We're we're only talking about that globally now, yeah. uh, since last year. But but it's not new. So yeah. so how do we overcome those uh, challenges? And how can I, with my network, help you be a success? Uh, and how can I help to optimize your production? And and not by saying I have all the answers and, and I can teach you how to run your business. That is totally the wrong way of doing it. But being curious as to, oh, why, why, is, uh, why, why did you set up this? And where do you want to be in five years? And what is your business strategy? And what is your history? And what is your legacy? And, and really being curious. Um, th that is where I see the stronger partnerships. And, and this is where I also see this, uh, let's call it the... Uh, information highway that that uh, some of my customers are, are normally asking to and, and wanting to set up but but the supplier is not really an active partner in this but when when they start to be curious uh, as in, in what is at stake and what is at play at the supplier side the information will start uh, flowing when i look at this, this this picture you know with two hands why uh, and a hard? Why is it hard black? And you know, uh, it has to do related to the challenges. And uh, why is it hard shaped? Uh, no reason. Uh, the the reason why I chose this picture is because it's 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 not. Um, maybe that's the uh, the um, some of the insights that I got from from writing my first book. I interviewed a, a Chinese general manager, and I uh, interviewed her on uh, doing business with Europeans or Scandinavians, mm -hmm. and I said, well. Uh, what what's it really like to do business with uh, yeah with Scandinavians or, or so to say mm -hmm. uh, as in, in general and and she said well funny thing because one thing is that uh, in in Denmark or in Scandinavia you will have focus on the ball in China we have focus on the players mm -hmm. I think that puts it into perspective because she's totally right I've heard so many people over the years saying focus on the the goal focus on the ball focus on the yeah the the end goal or so to say of the project but but chinese people will have focus on the people and and this is why they can this is why a plus b is not it's it's not uh, certain that it will be c because it as people are involved then things can happen so if i don't really know what b will be like then how will i know if it will be c or d Mm -hmm. So, so this is the way of thinking that is so so 
uh, totally different and, and has totally different angles to it. Scandinavians are result oriented. Uh, Chinese or Asian people are relationship oriented. So, so this is to, to finding the heart of the business and to really understanding why are you in business? What is your vision? What is your dream, your goal? How can I uh, assist you in climbing Mount Everest if I don't know why you want to go there? Or if, is it in how fast you will go there or in which condition you will go there? If I don't know that, how will I make you, you successful? But I see a lot of European companies um, forgetting a, a little bit to, to add all of those details because they take time. Yeah. yeah. You know, another, another, another thing is that I, 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 uh, I hear myself. <laughs> uh, I, I read somewhere that uh, Asian people are looking at pictures in a different way than uh, Western uh, uh, people, European and American people. So American and European people are looking more at details in pictures, whereas uh, Asian people looking at, uh, at the picture more holistically. Yes. So uh, the surrounding and uh, the, the Western people are looking at who's in the middle of a picture, uh, whereas uh, uh, Asian people uh, are looking at the whole picture and uh, there was some testing of how uh, uh, mm. Asian people are looking at uh, at pictures. Um, but how do you, you know, uh, it, it's all about relationship. But how do you start mm. and how do you handle uh, to create this this is kind of uh, uh, good relationships? Yes, this is one of the models that I use, uh, and there's a lot of models. This is just one of my favorites. It's uh, the design thinking innovation model, mm -hmm. because what I've been um, what I've been helping a lot of uh, companies uh, to do is to make themselves attractive uh, in the global market uh, in terms of suppliers. So how do you make yourself attractive if you cannot negotiate uh, from financial strength? Uh, you turn to innovation. And then I hear when when I do these keynotes, uh, I hear a lot of arguments that you cannot innovate with Asian or Chinese suppliers, uh, and and this is simply not the case. This is because you skip the empathize um, phase of this design thinking innovation model, where you really try to understand each other and and really try to set up a partnership and not just look up in the. Yeah, I was about to say phone book. <laughs> That's how old I am. But but <laughs> yeah, you cannot just uh, Google um, a supplier and then you can send him an order and then he will know everything there is to know about this order and he will uh, be uh, perfectly capable of uh, in in an active way uh, designing everything from the product to the surroundings to the uh, box uh, to the wordings to the brand name to what now. Um, and this is, of course, not the case. We, we need to honor the experts in, in the value chain and the experts are not always ourselves. Mm -hmm. you, you're referring to that uh, Asian people are copy all kind of Western products. That yes. kind of stuff. That, yeah. that's, that's the cliche, I would say. It, it's a cliche, yes. Uh, and, and let me just say that I've helped more than 400 companies since uh, since I started up my, my business in 2011. And, and I have seen two examples of uh, copying, uh, I, uh, uh, exploiting IP rights. Two yeah. examples. Out of 400, it, okay. Out, out of 400. And, and in uh, those two examples, it was actually not the supplier who had done wrong. Mm. Very interesting, I think. And who, who was wrong? So who, you know, what, what happened it, then in those cases? It, yeah, and in, in both cases, it was the uh, European company who did not honor their side of the uh, contract, so to say. Mm. All right. So going through this model, so you have to empathize, yeah. empathize uh, and uh, divine, ideate, prototype and test. So what, what is the, the biggest hurdle when you set up a supply chain from China, uh, either for China or in, from China? Yeah, well, that is, uh, if you skip to the next slide, that is actually the, the emphasize, uh, oh, sorry, next one again. So, so the emphasize uh, phase of it, because this is where you will actually um, understand each other exactly this slide. Um, because when you have, how can you skip the understanding part? If, mm -hmm. if you skip directly this phase and, and you go uh, directly to making a, a co-creation of a prototype or your co-creation of some process in your production or how you can optimize price or how you can do what now. Um, if, if you skip the understanding, 
then, then it, it will never it will never work. Uh, but if you spend a lot of time in the understanding phase, this is where the magic happens. Because if you have mutual understanding, then you have this information flow, and you have all the offerings and innovative solutions being offered by the supplier to the European customer. Um, and I've seen this again and again. And the funny thing is that a, a flight ticket, now we cannot really count that we can fly wherever we want to go every day, uh, but a flight ticket is, is more or less the same if you go from Europe to Asia or the other way around. But I don't see many European companies inviting the experts from their factories or supplier side to, to visit their design uh, facilities within Europe to, to sit down together and to have this uh, understanding of each other and, and to understanding not just the customer and the supplier, but also the end consumer. Why is it that it's important that this uh, surface will be glossy and have no scratches? And by no scratches, I mean no scratches. So why is it important that it's uh, the packaging is, is like this? Why is it important that we should it should have this function or, or what now? But the greater the understanding is from the beginning, the better the cooperation will be. It also has something to do with the cliche of inviting Chinese to Europe that, you know, because of uh, the IP uh, uh, rights yes. violation, that kind of stuff. Yeah, this is what I hear. Oh, that is uh, one of the cliches that is uh, an, an obstacle and, and what is keeping European from harvesting this wonderful opportunity because imagine uh, what how many resources time-wise and financially you would save if you invited the expert into your innovation or, or your design phase rather than sitting down and, and designing everything finished and, and making the beautiful drawings then you send them out to the to the supplier and they're looking at this drawing and they're saying hmm, how should i get it out of the tool it's a beautiful product, but I cannot produce it. And then you wasted so many hours in, in designing this or optimizing this and, and or what now. But, but the understanding part is also where you cannot really, you cannot really put two lines under an ROI for the board reading to begin with, right? Yeah. So, so this is why I'm so happy to see that supply chain is now being of strategic importance and supply chain is moving upwards in the prioritization in the organization is and it is now represented in at, at the boardroom level and, and this is where it should be in my opinion because i think it's uh, it's critical to to all every business but but really understanding why we should spend time with each other and time with each other can also be in a teams meeting or in an air meet like we sit there right now but simply talking to each other and being curious and into how we can overcome these obstacles together is, is important. It, it's an interesting you know, uh, uh, thing you're mentioning right now because uh, Charles Fine, MIT professor, wrote a book, Clock Speed, I think in 1998, I think. And he was stating that um, at the first start, uh, design or R&D department is uh, starting a new product. Supply chain should be at the table. Yes. There's a designing for supply chain. But you are also saying, you know, if you're outsourcing so part of the supply chain, or your manufacturing, you should also uh, embrace your supplier, whether it be in China, from China, or where, somewhere else. They should be involved to be, you know, to uh, to have some saying in it, because otherwise you make mistakes. So I was wondering, you have two quotes. I need do I, I need to find someone who can help me around the house painting, mm -hmm. and a more detailed one. So yeah. what what is the first and what is the second, and what should you prefer when you're dealing with? Uh, well, the Why? first one, I, I need to find someone who could help me around the house. If, if this is this is just an example that I marked down to, uh, to, to if this was something that you would say to your neighbor, for example, let's just say, I need to find someone who can help me around the house. Okay. It's like, what, what do you need? Do you, do you need somebody to, to clean or to paint or to what now? Uh, instead of, I need a skillful painter that can help me to paint my windows, deep blue, Pantone, this. Then it's very specific. And then the neighbor or the supplier um, being referred to um, will have a, a better understanding of what is it in detail that you're going to ask of this project. And, and why is it, th this is totally uh, two different scenarios uh, of how you could help each other. And, and it is two different scenarios of what is the project really about.
Yeah, you know, yeah, but you can be sometimes too detailed, and uh, is it, you know, True. maybe some, some some supplier could have more uh, alternatives uh, than the, the the Pentone number nineteen, etc. So yeah. that, there's something in the middle. Um, you had some slide uh, about cultural differences. Should we discuss yep. it, or should we move yep. on to to uh, the, the the matrix? You want to? Up to you. All right. Uh, well, we can we can spend a, uh, a few seconds on on this one because yeah. this is uh, I think this is what explains why it goes wrong. Uh, this is the Richard Lewis model, and uh, I just uh, marked down the uh, I found um, uh, some of the more typical ones: the India Pakistan and the Chinese one, and then I found the uh, the Netherlands uh, on on the left hand side. So you can see that if if we take like uh, Richard Lewis's model. Uh, to see how how will we look at the world, then we are totally opposite. And if we're totally opposite, then we cannot make sentences such as they should know that dot dot dot, or they can presume that dot dot dot. They cannot do that since we think totally different. And this is what we have to remember when we we set up these corporations that that we are totally different when it comes to culture and and when it comes to the way we look at the world. And and this is what we need to remember. And the interesting part is, you know, if you want to um, reshore close by in Europe, uh, yeah. look at Turkey and Bulgaria, that's near to India. So there's also yeah. a cultural difference over there. And even exactly. to, to Romania, you also have to uh, invest a lot uh, culturally to to uh, to get to know each other better. So uh, there's no easy way around to, to get to no. know each other. Yeah. Absolutely right. When you're only crossing one border, it doesn't make it easy. <laughs> Yeah, I spent a lot of times in uh, in Scandinavia in the last years before COVID nineteen in Denmark, Finland, uh, uh, Norway, and Sweden. And Scandinavia to the outside world look uh, uh, to seem like one, but even if you look closer, you know there's a huge difference between Finland and and, and Denmark, and even exactly. between Sweden and, and Norway. <laughs> so uh, yeah, those... yeah, yeah. You know, I lived in the Netherlands, and and there is a difference between the Netherlands and Denmark, even. Yeah, <laughs> so it, yeah. yeah. But there are more similarities to Denmark and Netherlands than to the Netherlands and Germany, or even to yeah. Denmark. Yeah. Funny thing. Um, look at this. We, we are almost mm -hmm. out of time, but it's uh, quite yeah. interesting, you know. But um, so how to deal with it and how did, should you uh, map out your growth? Yeah, well, first off, um, to, to reply the question, how do you fit your supply chain to growth in an ever-changing world? Mm -hmm. I, I would say there is a, there is the, the importance of the relationship. And I, I think we cover, covered that already. And that can be done without any money at all. But then you need to invest in time. Or if you don't have any time, then you need to, to invest financially. So that that will be the balance between it so if we if we just uh, take a two by two matrix like i, I did here and this is again a non-scientific <laughs> two by two matrix this is made from my experience alone so it's a very practical um slide you could say and i studied or i i reflected on the the relation between financial strength and time to market, because either you will have money or you will have time. So I put it into black and white, I know, because there's always shades of grace within it. Uh, as you say, there's something in the midst of things, right? Yep. But yep. Uh, but you can see here, if you, if you go to the lower uh, left-hand um, square, uh, you could say if you don't have too much uh, financial strength, you don't have too much time to deal with, then you should focus on collaborations. Then you should not um, buy a new production site and set up things that is outside your, your supply chain. You should focus on scalable production. You should be able to scale it up when you get the big orders or scale it down when you don't have so many orders if if the the changing world is uh, is in focus as well and, and build strong relations. Um, and actually, I, I read a, a quite interesting article in the Supply Chain Management Review by Michael Gravier, I believe it was, uh, who said that he, he thought that we would actually see more outsourcing uh, in the future because of the flexibility that that will give us rather than having everything in-house. And okay, and, and move to the rest. We are uh, one minute uh, left in the, yeah. in, in the webinar. So uh, what? how do you explain the, the other three quadrants 
Uh, well, in the financial strength, if you have a, a, a lot of cash, cash is king these days, right? So if you have a lot of cash and, and finances are, are not an, an issue, I would set up the logistic hubs uh, such as Bestseller is doing right now or, or set up regional hubs so that you don't have to, um, to, to rely on these freight charges being normalized. Uh, I would uh, figure out a way to use my relationship to uh, to have warehouses by the supplier side so i will i will use forecasting to build up uh, um, warehouses at the supplier side and i will also use dual sourcing so i would minimize my risk um in yeah. in this and and moving on to the right hand side strategic partnership is of course ev what everybody dreams about but strategic partnerships should be of strategic projects uh, products so it should not be with all of your suppliers but it should be with the suppliers who will produce strategic uh, products to you or services uh, and this is where you could set up uh, permanent logistic centers uh, and extend your supplier folio to again uh, minimize your your risk okay. and if you have a lot of time but uh, limited financial resources uh, i would try to optimize my forecast accuracy because the better I can plan ahead, the, the less um, disruptions I would uh, be experiences on freight charges. Let's uh, take that ex as an example again. Uh, and I would see if I could bundle up some orders with retailers in the same industry as I was in. And, and see if, if that could give us some volume at supplier sites. Uh, and I will try my best to simplify the production, either lower the number of commodities or lower the, the number of handlings so that uh, some of the finances could be saved in the production. Um, sounds very uh, practical and great, uh, but yeah. um, um, unfortunately we are out of time. We have only one slide left, uh, but... Um, and we can talk on for hours probably but um <laughs> you know um when you have questions uh, uh you know uh, send the questions to uh, to Heidi you see the contact details here um it, unfortunately she had to leave to jump to another uh, board meeting uh, i know yeah. actually one minute ago um so i will be uh, um in uh, Aramid, if you want to talk further to me, and I will be sitting on table one, so uh, the audience can uh, share with me and uh, have a conversation with me in the next uh, 30 minutes. Uh, with that, I would like to wrap up and uh, thank, uh, especially you, Heidi, for your conversation and your insight. Welcome. In Denmark. Yeah. It Welcome. Nice. It, it was fun. Yeah. And and I envy you that you have the time to uh, to have this uh, air meet uh, with the participants. Okay. No, that's great. You know, <laughs> and uh, we will uh, go Take continue notes. on. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll have an article about this and uh, we will continue this webinar Wednesday series also in the next year. So uh, maybe we'll see you again. And hopefully I, see we'll, I will see you face-to-face uh, uh, -face someday in the near future. Heidi, uh, let's so. uh, jump to your uh, uh, board meeting right now. Thank you uh, so much for having me. It was fun and, and let's debate another time. We will, we will. And yeah. the audience, okay. thank you for, for joining. Thank you. And I will be uh, in the, the lounge in the next uh, 30 minutes. So if you want to join me and talk to me, I will be there. Thank you for joining me. And uh, we'll have another uh, next webinar in, I think, two weeks' time or three weeks. Uh, December the 2nd, we will talk about top 28 supply chain executives of Europe, the ranking we have made. Thank you. And I will see you uh, in the lounge or I will see you later in the next uh, webinar Wednesday. Thank you and bye-bye.